Okay, I am told that we are live. Um, I, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry that we could not do this in person, but I'm glad that I get to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Danny Ryan. I work with the Ethereum Foundation on uh, the research team, primarily on layer one scalability and upgrades. Um, the project generally is called ETH2. Um, I do a lot of research, spec writing, and a lot of coordination around the project in general. Um, and today, here, let me share my screen. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about the future of Ethereum mainnet, um, AKA the state of the ETH1, ETH2 merger, AKA phase 1.5, AKA the merge. Um, I did not prepare slides today. I don't like preparing slides. They take me a long time. And I figured since I'm on my computer, um, I can treat this more like you are my colleague and I have some notes up and some different links and I want to update you on something. So it's an experiment, bear with me. I think it'll go okay though. So um, today I'm gonna to talk to you about a little bit of context. If you saw Vitalik's talk yes, um, right before mine, that is a lot of the context. Um, a little bit of the history and into the present where we're at right now. Some options for the future, AKA uh, what does this all mean for Ethereum mainnet? Where does Ethereum mainnet fit into uh, this E2 upgrade? <laughs> and um, a discussion of phase 1.5 or the merge, uh, which is the current direction for uh, what's gonna happen to Ethereum mainnet. I'll talk about overview, structure of engineering and uh, the progress and some huge shout outs to um, those engineers and researchers that are involved. So moving on, a uh, little bit of context. Some of this is uh, very obvious. Um, Ethereum is a, by any standard, um, a huge success. Um, there's an incredible amount of innovation and usage going on, uh, but it's also bursting at steam. Um, we have pushed, we are currently uh, pushing Ethereum to the limits. Um, you're seeing gas usage um, through the roof and gas prices through the roof. I actually did this, put up this link last night. I'm gonna do a reload and see where we're at. Reloading, reloading. Oh, my internet might suck. Um, anyway, gas prices are through the roof. Yep, wow. Uh, that's, I think, the largest I've ever seen. Um, you see, you know, there are some, obviously, some scams. Uh, Ponzi schemes love Ethereum. But uh, there's also some really interesting things going on with DEXs, going on with yield farming, going on with uh, all sorts of stuff on here. I don't look at this a lot. Um, but anyway, uh, tons of innovation going on. Uh, the Ethereum community, the Ethereum DAP developers, um, Ethereum users are really awesome um, and we have to uh, meet their needs uh, by fulfilling the promise of having a you know, global decentralized application platform. Um, and we do have a global platform. Um, it is decentralized um, and it's an application platform, but it can't quite handle the scale that we're looking for. So thus ETH2, which is a multi-year, multi-phase upgrade of Ethereum's core consensus. Um, at first, this is um, an architecture built in parallel to the existing Ethereum chain, um, which allows for rapid iteration. Uh, but sooner rather than later, uh, the plan is to hot swap Ethereum's consensus from proof of work to the ETH2's proof of stake and charter consensus. And that's, that's what I'm talking to you about today. So that was some context. Moving on to mystery into the present. If you saw Vitalik's talk. Uh, this has been a research um, even since before Ethereum was launched, uh, the research into proof of stake and charting was happening. Um, a couple of years ago, this was coming to a head uh, to be implemented on mainnet. Uh, this was proof of stake, it was a hybrid proof of stake model, which was to uh, slowly transition the proof of work into a full proof of stake system, uh, EIP 1011. And a lot of work was done on this uh, sharding manager contract with some old Viper code, uh, which is kind of cool to see. It has some of the same um, constants and things that we're working with in these two today. Anyway, these are two parallel paths uh, that we're attempting to not uh, make too intensive of changes to Ethereum mainnet, uh, but to layer these new uh, proof of stake and charter protocols into it. Um, these the limitations of doing this inside of Ethereum mainnet uh, were strong. Um, it was the what we could actually handle um, and do to these upgrades was limited by doing that. Um, and we we're solving a lot of the same problems in, the, uh, in both places. And so we opted for a unified uh, 
design, a more radical design, which combined proof of stake and sharding, uh, unified the two uh, kind of layer one validator games into one design. And I, I bring up these past uh, points because people go, well, I wish we had just had done 1011. I wish we had just done sharding the other way. It's my, uh, my belief that to do either of these sufficiently well, we would have ended up with an architecture similar to that of what we have today with the Beacon Chain and ETH2. And so playing either of these out, we were going to have to continue to upgrade, continue to um, create sophisticated consensus mechanisms until we got to essentially what we have today um, and unifying it, um, that's you know, the better path. But Asha, uh, these things are on testnet today, uh, the phase zero of uh, ETH2. You can check it out. There's a lot of clients working on this thing. No fewer than seven. There are five on um, the Madasha testnet right now alive. And actually, this is really built by a small army. There's tons and tons of um, teams and individuals uh, banging on this thing. Uh, and the Madasha testnet, I check this out every once in a while. Proto, Crylabs, Stakewise, different people proposing blocks. Generally, it looks pretty healthy, um, which is very exciting. I'm kind of prepping for that mainnet launch. So, some options for the future. So, we have this upgraded, we have this ETH2 consensus mechanism, which is proof of stake, uh, proof of stake and sharded consensus mechanism. And we have existing Ethereum mainnet, often called ETH1. Um, how do these things play together? Uh, what is the relationship between the two? Um, and what's the future of? Uh, Ethereum mainnet, ETH1, in the context of this upgraded consensus mechanism. So there's a number of things that we can do, uh, and these have been well researched and documented, um, and there's this one path that we're currently taking. So let's talk about some of the things that we can do. The finality gadget. So the hybrid proof of work proof of stake mechanism called EIP 1011 was essentially layering proof of stake on top of proof of work so the proof of stakers um, finalized the proof of work chain, the proof of workers still just built the chain. Um, this, you can see this is like the beacon chain pointing back to uh, the proof of work chain and finalizing chunks of it. Um, this is doable with the current infrastructure. Um, this takes some uh, breaking changes or introduces some breaking changes to the um, ETH1 mainnet and um, gets some of the benefits. It's, economic finality is nice, uh, but it's not like doesn't give us huge scaling benefits. Um, and, it, and as I said, introduces uh, some consensus complexity. So this is like a nice thing to do to give us some benefit now, but maybe um, not worth the complexity. Uh, Mikhail dug a little bit deeper and checked it out um, you know, on the way to ETH1 finality, if you want to read that here. Um, this is not the current path, the current approach, because it just doesn't quite give us that radical upgrade that we're looking for. Um, here's kind of an extension of it. Once you have that finality, you could potentially build a two-way bridge, moving assets, having contracts communicate over an asynchronous mechanism. Um, again, this is not, this doesn't really fulfill the promise of E2 and, and, and capture um, the benefits of E2, the full benefits for the existing Ethereum chain and the existing Ethereum community. Um, the path instead that we're following today, which is, um, I think, honestly, the cleanest of these, any of these other methods, um, even if they're temporary, introduce consensus complexity and kind of get us halfway there, partially there, uh, and kind of like add a lot of complexity for not that much benefit. So instead, we're opting for uh, this ETH1, ETH2 merge, which essentially is a hot swap of existing Ethereum's sorry, like that, um, consensus mechanism from proof of work to the beacon chain, to that sharded proof of stake mechanism that ETH2 is. Um, and sorry, uh, through, as it turns out, and I'll talk about this in a minute, not that big of uh, changes. Um, and this can be done in a, in a very transparent way, meaning that uh, current users and current dApps experience little to no um, friction in this migration. So uh, Vitalik wrote up a post uh, December 2019 that talks 
how we can do this in a more expressed fashion. And since then, uh, we formed like a small working group in which we are uh, writing specifications and doing some uh, prototyping. And we have some prototypes. So let's dig into that. So this has become uh, deemed the merge or phase 1.5. And I'll talk to you a little about the overview, structure of engineering, and progress. So uh, if you've seen any anyway talks, you've seen this diagram, show away, great diagram. Thank you. I've used and abused this thing. Um, once we get to phase one, we this is what this is the, the ecosystem, this is what Ethereum looks like. We have the current proof of work chain still chugging along. We have the beacon chain, which is this like core system chain for ETH2. Uh, this is where the validators live. This is where the validators do finality. And this is where the validators are told which shard chain to build and validate at any given time and the links between all of the shard chains. These are the shard chains. You can think of any one of these shard chains kind of like an instance of Ethereum mainnet today, uh, executing in parallel and unified under a single consensus mechanism. Um, and so at phase one, we have shard chains, but we don't have date or execution on these shard chains. Instead, they're just data availability, which uh, has a lot of benefits, potential benefits uh, to the Ethereum ecosystem um, and is it quite an engineering feat. Um, and so this is a very exciting state, but the next stage is, okay, what do we do with current Ethereum proof of work mainnet? Well, let's just roll it into one of these shards. Uh, so this is the Deacon chain. These are those shard chains you were looking at. And this is that, um, Ethereum mainnet, that ETH1 chain, built just as a shard in parallel with all the other shards. Um, it is an exceptional shard, exceptional meaning that it has a little bit of extra logic around its rules. So these, um, these shard blocks uh, that are just data availability have a little bit more simple rules in that uh, they're blocks, they have uh, signatures from the proposers, and they have just a blob of data. There's no extra validation on that blob of data. And when I say blob of data um, for this uh, ETH1 shard chain, that blob of data is instead uh, can be uh, interpreted as layer one transactions, as user transactions that we think of today on Ethereum. So this exceptional ETH1 chain uh, has all the same validation rules and it's built in a similar mechanism to these other chains. Uh, Pressing, pressing buttons, like you can't do that. Um, <clears throat> so the feed one chain has all the same consensus rules as the other shard chains. They're built by the same validators, but that blob of data actually has meaning with respect to layer one. Uh, it has uh, and it has validity rules. So instead of just checking, you know, does this or is the proposer signature correct? It doesn't have a blob of data. It's is the proposer signature correct? And can I execute that? blob of data against the EVM and come to a post-state route and agreement on the things like in proof of work today. Um, so one really exciting part of this is that the, what we've been building in ETH2 over the past two years is essentially a piece of software that is a highly sophisticated consensus uh, mechanism. Uh, it is, can handle hundreds of thousands of validators. It can handle uh, dozens of shards. Um, and it doesn't really care deeply what that C software is today, it doesn't really care deeply about what's on those shards. And thus, uh, whereas ETH1 clients today are highly sophisticated, <clears throat> they, are, they have a consistent mechanism, proof of work. Proof of work is very relatively simple compared to proof of stake and sharding. Um, and what the optimizations are generally on in ETH1 client today is in the user layer in execution, it's in transaction processing, it's in managing the transaction mempool um, and gas pricing and all, all sorts of stuff. And so we have these two highly optimized pieces of software uh, that are for different portions of the stack. Um, and so in the phase 1.5 vision of the software, um, these two pieces of software live and work together. Um, and so in the future, what we expect to be uh, an Ethereum client is actually an ETH2 client living alongside an ETH1 client uh, in which an ETH2 client is kind of the master, uh, the leader of the system and driving consensus and the, the ETH1 client living, uh, which in this 
each research post, I call an ETH1 engine. The ETH1 engine is providing access to state and access to execution, access to val user level validation. Um, so maybe, I don't, I don't, I wish I had a, a name change, a name suggestion change. I think ETH1 and ETH2 are, are um, misnomers in this, uh, at this point. The, in ETH, it, it implies some sort of a sequentiality that doesn't exist. Instead, it's, it's really just separation of layers. Whereas ETH1 is essentially like the user layer and ETH2 is kind of like the system layer, maybe the kernel, you know, maybe it's ETH, the ETH kernel client, the ETH user client to take from the Linux uh, nomenclature. But hopefully, uh, well, ETH1 and ETH2, those terms might be here today, but uh, potentially they might change. Um, so we have the high level separation of concerns. This is what that looks like. The ETH2 client, the ETH1 client, the ETH2 client drives the ETH1 client um, via RPC. Um, and both retain this P2P communication. The ETH2 client handles the low level system uh, stuff. So it's gossiping uh, beacon blocks, attestations, and shard blocks. Whereas the ETH1 engine is handling um, the transaction state sync and other user layer things. Um, to dig a little bit deeper, the ETH2 client has the beacon chain, it has shard chains, one of which would be the ETH1 shard chain, it has that system level state called the beacon state, um, and it has, communicates by RPC. Um, and here we have the EVM, we have the transaction mempool, and we have that, that ETH1 state, whether that be a stateful or stateless state. Um, if you're following the ETH1X research, um, that's in progress migrating to stateful or stateless. So Mikhail um, wrote this to give us a little bit more context on the scope of the merger. Uh, it's an excellent post, you can check it out. Um, and Guillaume from the guest team uh, has another post about what does an ETH1 engine actually look like and how can we take guess and uh, mod it to become an ETH1 engine. Essentially it's, a, it's adding a consensus engine within guess uh, to be controlled by RPC instead of by of work or click. So there is this notion of consensus engine inside of Guest today. And Catalyst, which is what this piece of software is called, um, is essentially the taking of Guest and the addition of an RPC consensus. Um, these are the minimal uh, RPC communication calls that we need between uh, an ETH1 and ETH2 client. Block production, essentially, hey, ETH1 client, give me a base on your mempool, give me a good block, um, block validation. Uh, hey, I have a block, can you validate it against uh, actually executing in, in ETH1? Hey, the block insertion, can you insert this block into your local block tree? Um, and setting the head, if ETH2 drives the, the fork choice, and so if there's a reorg on the shard chain, I tell the um, ETH1 engine, hey, you need to do this reorg. The nice thing is, Guest generally handles all these in slightly different contexts already today. Um, and the reorg, uh, eventually because of, um, the fina economic finality in ETH2, uh, we get to have, like specify a maximum depth of this and actually you know, be a little bit more aggressive in printing. Um, Mikhail wrote up, actually independently wrote up what he thought the methods were gonna need to be and they turned out to be exactly the same. So that's a good sign. Um, this is the code Guillaume's written to mod the guest client uh, to be an ETH1 engine. Uh, it's actually, it's like 600 lines change, but a lot of it's like some stuff that got commented out and a lot of testing. So it's actually not too crazy of a change. Um, and we have a uh, full simulation. Uh, Mikhail has written a phase one client, written in Kotlin, uh, with the help of Alex from TXRX, who has um, written this like Anatole Python transpiler that uh, transpiles the Python spec into executable Java code. Um, and so we have the simulation that has um, a number of phase one shards run and a local ETH1 engine runs to um, produce and validate blocks on a single shard. And um, I will give you a quick demo and then I think that is all my time. So let's check this out. Over here we have we're going to run the, we're gonna run an ETH1 chain. And over here, we're gonna run another ETH1 chain. Um, this is going to be our producer. This is gonna be like our uh, a validator that's not a producer. 
we could actually have these run in the same place, but it's nice to like show the separation here uh, that you can have two different types of validators. Um, and let's take over here in this window, um, we're gonna run an H2 client that has 512 validators and is connected to um, an ETH1 engine for block production, an ETH1 engine for validating. Um, and we're going to go. So things are being initialized. We're setting up the BLS pairs. Um, this thing's about to start running. Okay, here we go. And things are cranking. You can look at both these one engines, uh, blocks are being imported. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit. So we have uh, beacon blocks are being produced. They have shard transitions from uh, both the shard zero and shard one. Um, we have uh, new, okay, so we asked the proposer ETH1 engine, can you produce a block for me? Um, and we ask, and we're doing block insertion. Um, we're asking then the processor ETH1 engine, so say I'm a, uh, on the beacon committee, um, I get a block, I need to validate it. So I validate like the proposer signature and other things with respect to ETH2 consensus. Um, and then I validate it against um, ETH1, uh, or I execute it and, and plug it in. Um, and if we just follow this, we're seeing well, a lot going on, but we're seeing many slots being created, we're seeing blocks being produced, we're seeing blocks being validated. Um, the next step of this demo is to, um, Oh, actually, I don't even know if this demo, if you can see this demo. Oh, yes, I think you can. Uh, the next step of this demo is to plug some of the old software that we know and love today, like MetaMask, um, point it at these E1 engines and demo that we can use existing uh, E1 infrastructure to interact with this E1 shard chain. Um, a lot going on. Uh, <laughs> This is one of my the more exciting pieces of the puzzle right now. Um, I think the unification of uh, Ethereum mainnet with the upgraded E2 consensus um, is like kind of the um, most exciting thing that's happening in the next year or so. Um, it unifies uh, different portions of the stack. It introduces the optimized, uh, highly optimized consensus with highly optimized user layer um, and kind of like brings the uh, vision of these two to all of you users and the community. So I think that that's time. Um, so I'm going to call it time. Thank you everyone. Talk to you all soon.